Shalom, my dear friends. Shalom from the holy city of Jerusalem. Today, the third day of the month of Shabbat, corresponding to the 30th of January. And we're gathering again today now with help of God for continuing our studies in the book of uh, Job, Sefer Iov, followed by Masechet Shabbat, Tractate Shabbat, both of which, to my mind, are really most uh, amazing and wonderful things to have the merit to learn. So let me begin today now with our class in Sefer Iov. Shalom today, the third day of the month of Shabbat of the month of the year 5,777, corresponding to the 30th of January of the year 2017. And today we continue with our studies in Sefer Yov, the book of Job, carrying on now with chapter 2. And in chapter 2, we come to the second stage of the challenge of God to the uh, Satan to test Job. And this follows initially a similar pattern to the pattern we had in chapter 1, starting now at chapter 2, verse 1. Vayehi hayom, vayovo b'nei ho Elohim lehisiatziv al Adunoi, vayovo gam hasoton besochom lehisiatziv al Adunoi. 
Vayihi Hayom, and it was the day. Hayom also means today, this very day. But here, as we mentioned yesterday, this is the day of judgment, God's judgment on Rosh Hashanah, which is the day of the year when all of the B'nai Ha'elohim, when all of the angels come. They came to stand, to attend for Hashem. And there came also the Satan, the adversary, in their midst, to attend in the presence of Hashem. In uh, Ivrit today, when a soldier is required to uh, show up for duty in the army, he's called Lehityatsev to uh, to uh, attend and uh, be ready for duty. So once again, in verse two, Hashem, as it were, initiates and indeed provokes the Satan into responding that it's time to heighten and intensify the challenge uh, that Job is going to be faced with. And Hashem said to the adversary, Where is it from which you have come? As Rashi explains this phrase, A mizeh, A where is it that you would say, Mizeh, from this place have you come? Where is the place you've come from? And the Satan, the adversary, answers the Lord and he says, as in the previous uh, portion, Mishut Bo'oretz, he is going all around the earth, all around the land, uh, spying, uh, uh, going uh, aside to every side track. his Halich Bo, going around and around in the earth. And the Lord said to the adversary, Have you set your heart towards my servant Yov, my servant Job? For there is none like him in the land, in the earth, a man that is pure, free of blemish, Yoshor, righteous, Yerei Elohim, he is fearing God. The Sor Mero, he has turned aside from evil, all as discussed in the discussion about the commentary on chapter 1. And he is still holding by his purity, even after those, uh, those, those, those terrible catastrophes that stripped him of all of his children and all of his wealth. He is still in his purity. And now God provokes further the adversary. You incited me, you seduced me to swallow him up, to devour him for nothing. <clears throat> now, of course, on the plane of God's unity, God is one with the adversary, the adversary, as we saw from the commentary of Ramban Nachmanides, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, as we saw from Ramban's commentary, the Satan is actually a malach, an agent of the Almighty. And here we see in this ongoing dialogue between God and his uh, uh, created Satan, God is leading forward the test that is coming to 
Job by saying to the Satan, well, uh, he's done well, hasn't he? Why did you uh, provoke, why did you uh, incite me this way? And now comes the answer, which as it were, God is, has been wanting to elicit from the Satan to lead the plot forward. Or be'ad or, v'chol asher lo ish, yitain be'ad nafsho. And the adversary said to the Lord, he answered, and he said, skin in the place of skin, and everything that is possessed by a man shall he give for the sake of his soul. Satan is saying, you've not yet given him, put him to the ultimate test. Or ba'ad or, skin in the place of skin. If a person sees a blow coming towards his head or vital parts, he will put his hand in the way of the blow. He will put the skin of the hand to sustain the blow in place of the skin of the face or the vital parts. He was prepared even to sacrifice a seemingly less important part of his body as long as the main parts of his body will remain intact and he will remain alive. He'd give all of his possessions and everything he has, even uh, an arm or leg, God forbid, for the sake of his living soul. Ulam Bat continues the Satan. Ulam Shalachno Yodecho. Vaga el atzmo, ve el besoro. Imlo el ponecho yevor cheko. However, send forth, please, your hand and touch, just touch with God's divine power to his bone and his flesh. See if shall he not to your very face bless you, euphemism for a curse, for a, 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 a cry of anger and rebellion. By Yomer Adunoi el Hasoton, he no veodecho, ach es nafsho shmor. And the Lord said to the adversary, there he is in your hand, but as to his soul, guard it. God is authorizing, authorizing the Satan to, to, to set his hand to Job's very body as long as he's going to preserve him in life. The Talmud, in its discussion about the book of Job, from which we quoted a part in Bava Basra, Daf Tesvov, Bava Basra, Tractate Babylonian, Bava Basra, uh, Folio 15, it says that actually the test that God gave to the Satan was more severe than the one he gave to Job, because the main task of the Satan is to take people's souls from them as mentioned by the Ramban in his introduction to Iyov, that is the main role of the Satan, he takes away the soul, and here he's not allowed to do this, he can cause every kind of affliction to Job's body, but he's not allowed to kill him, and indeed we do see in life how some people are, Aleinu, not upon us, victims of this terrible, terrible challenge which God is now giving to Job. So now from verse 7 in the Hebrew text of chapter 2 of Job, Vayetze hasoton meis penei adunoi, Vayach es iov bishchen ro, Mikaf raglo ad kod kodo. The Satan goes out from before the face of the Lord. And he strikes Iov with this shechin. Vayach es Iov. He smote Job with the shechin ro. The shechin ro 
is an eruption of inflammations and infections in the skin of the body. The biblical shechin takes different forms. The dry form, uh, which is uh, dry and burning, or the moist form, which is full of uh, of uh, exusions from the body. In both cases, they are ra, they are evil. And here God has struck him mikaf raglo from the sole of his foot, ad kodkodo until his skull, his head, his uh, his top. Now, Shrin was one of the ten plagues that God sent upon the Egyptians. We see that the magicians of Egypt were unable to stand up to this terrible disease. The Shrin is one of the disqualifying maladies of, of, of priests. If they have such a malady, they may not serve in the temple. An animal that has the animal forms of Shrin is also invalid for temple service. It's the most terrible affliction as we now see. It is, 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 is totally disfiguring. It is uh, agonizing and excruciatingly painful. And here in verse Ches, we see Job's response to this terrible affliction. And he took for himself a shard, a broken piece of a pot, Lehiskoreid boy to scrape himself with. Vehu Yoshei Besoicho Efer, he's sitting in the ashes. He's come to the lowest level of human degradation, come right down. Batoimer loy ishto, or the chom hazik besumo secho. And his wife says to him now, verse 9, they said to him, his wife, are you still holding true to your purity? Bless God and die. What are you trying to accomplish by bearing this new level of disaster, having lost all of your worldly possessions, and now you are crushed to the ground with this uh, debilitating uh, bodily uh, illness. Why don't you just give up and uh, uh, express what is in your heart, your rebellion against God, and die? By Yomer Eleho, Kedaber Ahas Hanavolois, Tedaberi, Gam es hatov nekabel me es ho Elohim, ve es ho ro lo nekabel, bechol zos lo choto iov isfosov. And he said to her, as the speaking of one of the nevolois, one of the lowly, deplorable woman full of foul mouth, is that the way you are speaking? Shall also we accept the good from God, but the bad shall we not accept? Despite this, Eov did not sin with his lips. Well now, It is this verse that is the source of the idea that Job's wife was Dina, the daughter of Jacob. And the connection here but with Dina in Job's words is that when he says, are you speaking like one of the nevolos, one of the deplorable uh, base women? Uh, This word is reminiscent of the verse in Genesis in the chapter in the portion of Vayishlach, when Dina has been uh, captured and raped by Shechem, the son of Hamor, and the sons of Jacob says, uh, uh, and this is described as an act of nevala. Nevala is the basis possible action. Nevela in the laws of Kashrut, in the laws of Shechita and 
uh, inadmissible, unkosher animals. A nevela is an animal that has uh, died. It's not been properly slaughtered. It is nevela. It is meat that is totally unfit for consumption by Israel. And uh, we find in the book of Samuel, the name of Naval is said to be directly suitable to his heart, that uh, Naval, the wicked f- first husband of Abigail, who later married King David, Naval was a deplorable individual with a, uh, a, 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 an evil eye. So uh, it is the connection between Nivala, shall Nivala be performed in Israel in Genesis when the sons of Jacob are faced with the rape of Dina and Job's use of the word Nivalois here in this verse that is the foundation of the Midrash that Job's wife was uh, Dina, the daughter of Jacob. And as we have seen, if Job was the incarnation of Terah who had had union with his wife in her state of nida, menstrual impurity. Here the challenge of Dina was to atone for her having undergone the rape by Shechem. And uh, here the actual content of the verse, which is uh, primary for us, is that Job is teaching us that we have to accept both the bad and the good from God. We have to accept that both are aspects of God's uh, emanations to us, and we cannot accept only the good and reject and rebel against uh, the bad. So this, of course, is a, a fundamental teaching about the unity of God. And the verse concludes, Job did not sin with his lips. Well, now, this verse is also the occasion of a comment in the Talmud, and uh, that is that uh, while well, the verse says that Job did not sin with his lips, that is almost uh, asking us to dash him, well, if it was not with his lips that he sinned, where did he sin? And uh, according to the commentators, we shall look at uh, Ramban's most illuminating uh, commentary on exactly where Job did sin, what was his sin. We shall look at that uh, in our next session. But for now, let us uh, just note the Talmudic comment on this uh, this last section of the uh, the parasha that we've just uh, concluded. Job did not sin with his lips. Rashi here quotes from Bava Basra, Daf Tes Zayin Ahmed Aleph, uh, tractate Bava Basra of the Babylonian Talmud on folio 16 on the A side of the page. Avol belimoi choto. However, in his heart, he did sin. And we shall see in Nachmanides' uh, commentary on this section, and uh, which is another most important introduction to the understanding of the book, uh, we shall see exactly where he says that Job's sin lay. But for the moment, let us continue with chapter 2, to the end of chapter 2 of Eov, Going now from verse uh, 11, And they heard three friends of Eov. And they heard the three companions, the three beloved friends of Eov. These were a group of four that were 
companion uh, prophets and saints of that generation. They heard all of this evil that came upon Yov, and they came each one from his place. And here are the three major protagonists of the first two-thirds of the book introduced to us. Eliphaz HaTimoni, Uvildad HaShuchi, but Soifar Hanamosi, Eliphaz the Temanite, Teman in Hebrew refers to the regions south, south particularly towards the south of the Arabian Peninsula, Bildad the Shuchi and Sofar the Naamosi, Vayivo Adu Yachtov, they met together, Lovo Lonudlo to come to shake their heads in empathy with him, and to console him. As to the identity of these three prophets, enumerated in Bava Basra as three of the seven prophets to the nations with Job and also Elihu Barbarach El later on, these three Eliphaz HaTemoni, well Eliphaz is the name of the, the firstborn of, uh, of Esau, and there is some discussion in our commentators whether this is actually Eliphaz, the son of Esau, or whether a member of the family of Eliphaz, but without question of the family of Abraham, one that is a, uh, a monotheist who believes in the faith of the God of Abraham. Uvildad Hashuchi. Vildad is called the Shuchi, and according to the commentary of Ibn Ezra on this verse on Proverbs, he says that uh, uh, Bildad is one of the uh, one of the descendants of Shuach, who was of the sons of Keturah, the wife of Avraham, where the verse in Genesis chapter 25, verse 2, enumerates the sons of Keturah from Avraham as including Yishbok and Shuach. So again, Bildad is from the family of Avraham. Ibn Ezra on the same verse says that the identity of Sofar uh, as a Naamosi is not known to us, whether he's called a Naamosi on account of an ancestor or of his place. Uh, what is important to us is the wisdom that comes forth from his discourses in the book and the uh, Targum itself tells us about how it was that they gathered together the Targum of Yonatan ben Uziel on verse 11 tells us that uh, these three friends of Eov heard this evil that came upon him uh, when they saw the trees of their orchards that they dried up and that the bread of their meals turned into raw flesh, and that the drink turned into blood, and each one came from his place, and continues the uh, Targum with a very amazing comment, and in this merit that they gathered together to console Job, they were saved from the place that had already been marked out for them in hell, in Gehenna. So they came to console Job in this act of uh, empathy and mourning. Vayisau es enehem mirochok Verse 12. The three companions, by Yesus Enehem Rochok, they lifted up their eyes from a distance and they could not see him. 
They could not recognize him. This was not only a physical distance. They are now spiritually distant from this man who has become the target of God's most excruciating test. They could not recognize him anymore from this physical disfigurement from the, uh, 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 compared to the, the great man of, of wisdom, piety, and wealth they had known. And they lifted up their voices and they wept. And they tore, they rent each one his garment. They, they cast earth up upon their heads towards the heavens. These were acts of mourning, according to our commentators. This was the custom of mourning of that era, the renting of the garden, which, uh, of the garment which survives until today, and the laws of Torah, Avelut, mourning, and uh, the casting of earth over their heads. That is, according to our commentators, one of the customs of that time. Vayeshvu itoi looretz shivas yomim veshivas leilois veene duiver elov dovo ki ro ki goda la keev moed. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. Nobody could say a word, and they could not speak to him a word. Because they saw. How very great was the pain. After these seven days, Job opened his mouth. And he cursed his day. Here in these words in verse 13 of the companion sitting to uh, by Job on the ground for these seven days and seven nights. Here we have an allusion to the Israelite minhag of Nichum Avilim, the consolation of the mourners, where in those times it was customary for the mourner to be sitting on the ground itself and for the comforters to sit in this act of empathy on the ground with him and for these seven days and seven nights. And according to the halachot of Avelut, one may not open one's mouth if one comes as a comforter until first the mourner either opens his mouth or indicates that the comforters may speak. So it is Iov now who opens his mouth and curses his day. Well, let us turn now to the invaluable commentary of Ramban of Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman Nachmanides on this section of the book of Job. And let us uh, seek, to, uh, seek to understand what is the concept of Job cursing his day and why here is the opening to understand what exactly is considered to have been the sin of Job. This is Ramban's commentary on Job chapter uh, Job chapter 2 verse 1. He says, we find in the prophets also those that cursed their day. We find in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 14, Jeremiah says, Cursed be the day that has given birth to me. Only he says that the intention in Job was bad, as I shall explain. Ramban says the Companions actually recognized and understood the thought that lay behind his words. And here, although Job was not protested 
against Job with his lips, as the verse says, even in this, before the companions arrive, the end of verse 10, it said he did not uh, sin with his lips. Nevertheless, the underlying thought here was sinful. That is to say, it was a straying away from the emunah in the absolute unity and providence of God, which is the foundation of the faith that the Torah is bringing to the world. And now Rambam continues, he says, let me now explain the intention of the book in its entirety. When Job saw the many troubles and evils that came upon him, and he himself knew the righteousness of his own soul, he thought that perhaps there is no knowledge or accounting by God of the deeds of men, and that perhaps providence had simply departed from, there was no actual providence in God's government in detail of the affairs of men. And he opens his words here, the first words of Job in chapter 3, verse 1, uh, which are the, uh, the, 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 the discourse and the, uh, the oration or the soliloquy in, uh, in which Job does curse his day, says uh, Ramban, he, he, he says that Job considered that it was the power of the planets and the uh, stars and constellations on the day of birth and the moment of birth which would give to the newborn individual either uh, good or bad or both or or and he therefore inclined through this to the opinion of the sky gazers and the uh, the vanities of the astrologers and that is why he opens his soliloquy with the word let the day be lost that he was born on that it should not have been there he cursed the day and the night and the stars of the night time and the, uh, the 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 brows of the dawn in verse 9 of chapter 3 uh, because he considers that they were what caused his evil state and he argues that on account of the lowliness of man and the exaltedness of God, God will not pay attention to man. And therefore, Job considered that he was simply under the control of chance in accordance with the decrees of the, uh, the, the implacable uh, laws of the uh, of astrology of the stars and their influence over the earth and he considered in respect to adam respect to man to humanity just as we look at the other creations of the earth for we do not see any supreme providence in the way that we would understand it over the animals and, and birds and insects and other realms of creation. All we see there is that God sustains them in order to keep the, uh, the species existing, but there's not any uh, reward or punishment to any individual creature on any level. And we cannot say that, for example, if the animal was slaughtered, that it must have sinned, or that if the animal lived a long life, that it was somehow some merit, or uh, if uh, there was some merit to the animal, if it found its livelihood in uh, abundance. And this is Job's intent in the first soliloquy in the coming chapter, chapter 3. And uh, he returns to this later on in uh, chapter 7, verse 17, when he says, what is man that you have elevated him up? And there's other proofs later on when Eliphaz says to uh, 
to uh, to Job uh, in uh, chapter twenty two verse thirteen, Eliphaz says to him, "You've said what does man?" Uh, he says, "You have said what does God know? Is it through the fog and the mist that God brings about judgment?" He that the clouds are his secret place of hiding and he is not revealed. That is to say that in such verses, uh, there in chapter 22, verse 13, in these kinds of verses, this is, this is illustrating that, that Job's view was that there was no providence over the details of man any more than there is over the other creatures of the creation. And this sums up the Ramban here, uh, Job is removing the concept of providence from the lowly creatures and or from the uh, 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 or from, even from the, the, the great circuit of the heavens or uh, over the uh, God's providence is over sustaining the different levels of the creations in the heaven and the earth, but not in uh, in any particular uh, detailed providence over the the fate for good or bad of an individual. And uh, we shall see later on. Ramban begins quoting verses from later on. In the book, how this is indeed, uh, this is the opinion that Job uh, came to when he found it incomprehensible that in his great piety he should be suffering in this way. He could, he could see no rhyme or, or reason in it. And uh, even though Job does proclaim, and we see this in chapter 31, uh, verses 25, that he never ever denied God. and He could never, uh, could never have come for a moment to the idolatrous belief that there was any power to any star or galaxy in particular. Uh, nevertheless, uh, he, uh, Ramban brings proofs that Job held that God's providence was withheld from the low levels of creation in which we live. And our rabbis, and this is a midrash in uh, the midrash rabbi of Shemot of Exodus in section 30, uh, subsection 8. Our sages said that Job's sin was even more serious. And in the uh, elusive phrase of the midrash, it says, Ragam uh, esho ekoinin. Ragam, he stoned the Iconin. The Iconin would be the visages, the uh, the partsufim, the, uh, the 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 divine uh, uh, visages through which God reveals Himself to the world. Now, Ram, Ramban himself in this section, I will presently explain what I think Ramban is saying. Ramban quotes the words of Job in chapter 3, let the day that he was born on uh, be lost, and let that night be taken away by darkness. So here Ramban has quoted places where Job curses both the day and the night. And Ramban says that the intention is that Job was here rebelling both against God's attribute that is called day, his attribute of light, and also God's attribute of night, which is his attribute of darkness. In other words, kindness and severity. Job was denying both of them. He was saying that there was uh, uh, neither of these two pillars of God's providence was actually running the world of the lower creatures. And he says elliptically at the end, uh, elusively, uh, uh, Ramban concludes this section of his comment by saying, the one with wisdom will understand. Now my understanding of what 
Ramban is saying here, where he quotes this midrash that says that Job was destroying the Eikonin, the Eikonin, which is the uh, Aramaic word icon, uh, which is, of course, related to our modern word icon, and the icon in the Aramaic of the midrash of the Chazal would allude to the partsufim, which are described in the Kabbalah. And uh, uh, the two parts of in question here are those of Zeir Anpin and of the Nukva. Zeir Anpin would be the attribute of day and the Nukva would be the attribute of night. And by saying that Job was stoning them, he was uh, smashing them to bits, saying that this is not the source of the, uh, that there is no specific and detailed government of the lower realms because the whole interaction, according to the Kabbalah, between the Partsuf of Ze'er Anpin and the receiving vessel of the Nukva uh, is precisely what brings about all of the Hashkacha of the Holy One, blessed be He, on the detailed affairs of this world. Well, here we shall uh, leave this part of Ramban's commentary, and God willing, in our next section, uh, we shall take a further look at uh, the continuation of his commentary, where he is also, as by way of a, another general introduction to the book, he's going to discuss the various different Hebrew divine names that appear through the book and to analyze in detail when the Shem HaMafurash, the Tetragrammaton, the Shem HaEtzem, the essential name of God is used at certain points, particularly in the beginning and the end of the book, but not at all by the participants in the uh, book, in all of the uh, soliloquies and the orations with practically uh, only a, a tiny number of exceptions. The name of Hashem, Yudke Vovke, does not appear and said that are other names, Elohim or Eloah or Shaddai or Tzavakot. These are names, and Ramban will explain why these different names are used by the uh, the chief uh, uh, contributors to the debate. And this will serve as an introduction to our continuing study before we launch into chapter 3 and into the actual debate between Job and the companions. We will pause to look at the Zohar insights into the soul of Job and the uh, challenge he faced according to the text of our Mikra of the Bible. So with that, my dear friends, we complete our uh, study of uh, Tanakh for today, and we'll be coming very shortly to our class in the Mishnah Shabbos, continuing in uh, Mishnah Shabbos uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 1.
Hello, my dear friends. Back to our studies now, continuing with the study of the Mishnah Shabbat. It's uh, for me personally a tremendous joy to be able to study Shabbat with you. It is such a an extraordinary, amazing compendium of not only insight into the holy Shabbat through the uh, mysteries and through the uh, the uh, the obscurities of this tractate, but also uh, such an opening to the whole of the Torah. So with no further ado, let us uh, return to our study of tractate Shabbat. Shalom today, the third of Shabbat of the, of the year 5,777, corresponding to the 30th of January of the year 2017. And today we continue with our study of <clears throat> the first Mishnah of the Holy Masechet Shabbat, the tractate of Shabbat. And the first Mishnah, as we have said, stands apart from the rest of the first chapter. It is the opening of the whole Masechta and, prevent, and presents uh, very sharply in front of our eyes a certain uh, central issues relating to the main concept of Shabbat, it's a day of prohibition from Melacha, from the specific acts of labor as defined by the Torah and as set forth in our tractate. And there are certain fundamental concepts that we need to understand about the concept of Melacha, what exactly is a Melacha and uh, what is entailed by the violation of a malacha on some or other level. And our Mishnah begins with the malacha, which is actually listed as number 39 of the 39 paradigm archetypal labors of Shabbat in chapter 7 of Masachet Shabbat. The very last of the 39 is the labor of hotza'a, of carrying from one domain to another. And it's precisely this <coughs> halacha, this, uh, this malacha, which is chosen by the Mechaber, by Rabbi, Rabbi Judah the Prince, the author of the Mishnayot, or rather the assembler of the Mishnayot, the stitcher of these uh, tapestries and weaves of the Masechtot. It is with this 39th Malacha that he begins, says Maimonides in his commentary on the Mishnah, that uh, it's because this is the seemingly the least and the slightest of all of the malachot. It is, uh, uh, people would understand that uh, a baking or kneading or the slaughtering of an animal, or the trapping of an animal or the building of a, a wall or some other <clears throat> thing that normally people would consider to be work that would be included under the a category of forbidden malacha on the Shabbat, uh, and precisely because it is so, uh, <coughs> it, it seeming so insignificant to a person to carry out an object from inside of their home, their private domain, out into the street, so insignificant or vice versa, that this is where the Mechaber chose to start. The author of the Mishnah started here with this Malacha, which is seemingly so slight because you'd think, well, uh, uh, what really is so terrible about uh, about carrying out of the house into the street or vice versa on the Shabbat? Uh, if a person can't do that, it seems to shackle their very freedom. And indeed, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the the Jewish world, even those who are attached to the Torah on some level, have uh, almost completely, uh, in uh, many circles of of conservative or reform communities, completely forgotten about this prohibition of the Shabbat. In many Orthodox communities, there is the uh, Eruv, which comes to 
join a whole geographical area of a town or a whole village or a whole residential complex as one unity, which is all considered to be one house, one private domain. And this is accomplished through the Eruv. The Eruv is a, a mixing of all of the private domains of the individuals that own the houses in an area that is going to be cordoned off by the era of a kind of symbolic boundary around this area and all these individual householders and their houses will all be joined up together through the laws of the Eruv to join one community where carrying in and out of the houses into the streets from the house to the synagogue or uh, strolling the, uh, the, ch the, the the baby stroller to the park within the Eruv all becomes committed through permitted through symbolically making all of the the houses and individual properties into one large uh, family home. And in, in many, uh, many Orthodox communities across the world, both in Israel and in the diaspora, there are these Arabs. Well, now, <clears throat> the whole, uh, all of the details of the domains of Shabbat, spatially, the private domain of the home, the Rashut Hayachid, the the uh, the domain of the individual as opposed to Rashut Arabim, the domain of the many, the domain of the public, the street, all of these issues are actually discussed not in our tractate of Shabbat, but reserved for a separate tractate which comes right after Shabbat in the order of Moed, and that is the tractate of Eruvin. And tractate Shabbat assumes that the distinctions between the public and private domain are already known, <clears throat> and if not, that the teacher of the tractate will teach the students about these domains. And in fact, the opening Mishnah of our chapter is itself an introduction to the concept of domains and what it involves in a very clear, simple way. We learn about the first two of the four domains of Shabbat, uh, the other two being the Carmelis, which could be a field or a lake or a sea or some other, other area which is neither uh, a private domain nor a street or a highway. And then there's the fourth, which is a, a small uh, a thing standing in uh, the public domain. It's an elevated thing, which is not big enough to be a private domain. It's called an exempt space. We shall come to all of those uh, later on. But uh, before we go on into our first Mishnah and uh, the specific Malacha of Hotza'ah of, of carrying from one domain to the other, which it speaks about, and that's the same as hachnasa, bringing in, as mentioned uh, in our previous session, uh, that when we take the Sefer Torah out of the Ark that is called Hotza'ah, when we put it back into the Ark that is called hachnasa, in both cases we're moving from one domain to the other, and both of those two acts of either hotza'a bringing out or hachnasa bringing in, they're both included in the labor that we are speaking about, the malacha. But uh, before we continue, let's recall that in the beginning of the portion of Vayakhel, at the end of Exodus, when Moses commands the children of Israel before coming to the instructions to build the sanctuary he first commands them to work only for six days and to rest on the Shabbat. It is stated clearly there that one who violates the prohibited malachot of Shabbat, yumat, shall be put to death. Yumat, a very, very severe a prohibition. The most severe prohibitions of the Torah have the sanction of the death penalty. And in the case of the violation of the Shabbat, the penalty is death by stoning. Now that would only be the case if the violator of the Shabbat was duly witnessed by two kosher witnesses, as we have learned in tractates Sanhedrin and Makot. And the Violated would have had to have had a warning not to, to transgress directly prior to the act in question. So, in order to be liable to the actual 
rabbinical death penalty, which can only be imposed by a rabbinical court of 23, the person would have had to have a, 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 a warning in front of two witnesses who will testify before the court, and the person has to do it flagrantly. Now, this, of course, is very rarely the case. Uh, particularly in our times when most of the people uh, who are obliged to observe the Shabbat uh, have no knowledge of uh, the Shabbat, even of its uh, reality and existence, and are certainly uh, uh, not held liable to stoning. Where a person did not have a due uh, warning or due witnesses, but they nevertheless violated the Shabbat flagrantly, in other words, they knew what they were doing, but the vital components of witnesses uh, and the warning were absent when they did the deed, but they did it flagrantly, for them the penalty is karet, excision of the soul. That is excision, which could mean the cutting off of the person's years in this world and their excision from the life of the world to come or some level of the life of the world to come. If a person violated one of the prohibitions of the Shabbat unwittingly, and we're talking about one of the 39 labors, some act of malacha that comes within one of the 39 uh, paradigmatic uh, a forbidden malachot, if the person did it unwittingly, whether it was because they didn't know that this was a forbidden malacha, or they didn't know that today was the Shabbat, this person, when they become aware of uh, of their violation, otherwise they 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 uh, they would have to bring a sin offering in the temple, chatat. That is the atonement for an unwitting violation of the Shabbat. So the, these are an issue in terms of any violation of one of the 39 labors. And we shall see throughout this Masechta, uh, throughout this tractate, definitions of exactly what are the boundaries of, a, of, of each and every one of the 39 prohibited labors. What counts as a transgression? What counts, in other words, as an act that is a violation of the malacha? What is the uh, definition of the fulfillment of the malacha? Because the Mishnah being the foundation of Torah law has to determine where is the boundary between that which is permissible and that which is forbidden. Now, in our first Mishnah, we are going to be introduced to two fundamental terms uh, throughout the tractate. One of them is chayav, chayav, obliged, liable. That is to say, liable to all of the stringencies of the penalties of violation of the Shabbat, be it stoning with warning, be it excision without a warning but flagrantly, or be it a sin offering. If a, When the expression chayav is used in our tractate, it refers to a person who has incurred the liability of uh, the, the, the penalty for violation of a malacha. Our Mishnah also uses the expression patur, Patur exempt, that is to say, because this were, the, uh, the act in question was not an actual technical violation of the malacha, the person is exempt, free from any penalty, whether it is the stoning, the excision, or the, uh, the, the need to bring a sacrifice. Patur does not mean that the act in question is permitted. Because of the precise definition of what counts as a full malacha, any act that does not meet up to those qualifications will not uh, incur the penalty, but that does not mean that it is mutar. It is only when the Mishnah uses the expression mutar, released, and, uh, and, and, and the knot has been undone, only then is the act in question actually permitted from the outset. But where our Mishnah uses the expression patur, Exempt, that means that the person is only exempt from the penalty, but that the act may not be carried out from the outset. Well, now, one final word before we go into the text of the Mishnah, and that is about the general concept of melacha. 
Melacha is defined in the halacha as being melacha machshevet. Melacha, a labor, an act of labor that is machshevet, that is with a level of thought and intentionality in it. If a person, for example, it's forbidden to uh, to cut off even a piece of grass from its li- its life source, you cannot on Shabbos intentionally uh, you, you cannot intentionally uh, uh, cut down or grass or harvest crops or pick fruits off the tree. Uh, all of that is a violation of the uh, the the melacha of kitzira uh, of harvesting, which is cutting off a plant from its life source. Well, now, does that mean you can't walk over the grass on Shabbat in case you're going to uproot a, a blade of grass through your footsteps? Well, here where you walk through the grass. It is your intention to get from point A to point B. It's not your intention to uproot a blade of grass. And it is the intentionality of the act that is an integral part of the liability for a malacha. In other words, if a person did something accidentally or they did something that they were not intending to do, that itself is not the performance of malacha machashevet, of a malacha, an act of labor that has the thought and intentionality in it. So uh, with these concepts, we are now, with God's help, willing to, uh, w- uh, able to launch into the text of our Mishnah, the first Mishnah of the first chapter of uh, Shabbat. And we will first of all go through the Mishnah in a straightforward way. And uh, after that, we will go back over it in a little more detail. And let us understand that the first sentence of the Mishnah is somewhat confusing uh, because it is a statement of the general rule of four particular examples that are going to be elaborated in the later part of the Mishnah. We'll have a much better understanding of the first sentence of the Mishnah when we've already understood the continuation of the Mishnah and the four different situations that are recounted in the Mishnah. Yitzioyz HaShabos, the goings out of the Shabbat, and here the word goings out is referring to the Malacha of Hotza'a or Achnasa, the two labors that are one of carrying in or out from one domain to the other. The Mishnah is going to start telling us uh, how many basic categories there are. Yitzhiri Sashabos Shtaim Shehein Arba Bifnim. They are two that are really four inside from the perspective of the person inside the house. Ushtaim Shein Arba Bachutz, there are two that are actually four outside for the, from the point of view of the person outside the house. And in our situation, the People, uh, uh, the, the person inside the house is called the balabayis, the bal habayit, the bal, the owner of the bayit, the house. And the one outside is called the ani, the poor guy. This is for convenience. If the mission had to keep on repeating the person that is inside the house, the person outside the house, it would go on unduly long. So this way, the Mishnah calls them respectively the bal habayis, the owner of the house, and the ani, the poor person. And let us, before going past the first sentence, just understand that Yitzhiyus Shabbos, the basic categories of carrying out or in on Shabbos are two that are four from the point of view of the person that is inside. In other words, there are two basic acts that would be a violation of the Melacha of Chotza'a, a Torah, a violation of the Torah prohibition, and there's another two that are not actual violations, so that makes a total of four. From the point of view of the person inside the house, there's two that are really four, two basic acts of a violation of the Torah prohibition, and another two that are not complete violation but are also prohibited. 
And likewise, from the point of view of a person outside, Ushtayim Shein Arba Bachutz, there's two basic violations of the Torah prohibition from the point of the view of the person outside if he uh, he's putting something inside the house. And there's another two that are not an actual technical violation but are still forbidden. And now the Mishnah elaborates. Ketzad, how so? Heoni oimed bachutz if the poor person is standing outside and the owner of the house inside, we have erected the whole situation in one brief phrase. Category number one. Poshat heoni es yodoi lifnim venosan losoich yodo shel balabais. If the poor guy standing outside extends his hand into, through the window, or well, through the door, inside the house, and he puts something into the hand of the house owner. Rather unusual, maybe, you'd think that he wants something from the house owner. What he puts into the hand of the owner of the house is the poor man's basket in which he wants the hand, he wants the householder to put in some food for him to take out through the window or the door. So first of all, he's handing in his basket. Oi, or the second of the two that are prohibited from the point of view of the person outside. Or if he took something out of the hand of the house owner and took it out through the window or through the door out into the street. The poor guy is liable to the violation of the prohibition of the labor of Hotza'ah. The Balabais, his potter, the owner of the house, is exempt because he didn't do anything. He just had his hand stretched out and either the poor guy from outside put something into his hand or took something out of his hand. He's not done anything. He's called potter exempt from any violation of a laborer. That doesn't mean he should have done what he did because by being there with his hand stretched out, he's actually collaborating with the poor guy in the performance of the labor. But let us note that so far in these two situations, from the point of view of the poor guy outside, he's com- in, in, in these uh, two cases, he's, compl- he's completed a complete labor. He took something that was outside and he put it inside into a... Uh, a place where it will stay inside the house, or he took something that was inside and he pulled it out to the outside. So that's the first two cases. These are uh, the two acts from the point of view of the person outside that are prohibited from the Torah point of uh, the strict line of the Torah law. Now the reverse case, Poshat Balabais es Yodi Lachutz, here, the Balabais extends his hand outside, to the outside, to where the poor guy is standing. He puts what he took out of the house through the window into the hand of the poor guy. Or the other way around, he picked up the basket that was in the hand of the poor guy outside, and the house owner brings the object inside the house. Here the house owner is Chayov. He is the liable one for violation of the prohibition. But the poor guy is Potter. He is exempt even though he stands to benefit from this act. He's not done anything to actually bring in or take out the object. So he's exempt. Now, the Bartunura, Rabbi Ovadio of Bartunura, comments that uh, by bringing this situation, which you'd think is a human, humanitarian case, where we are trying to get this poor guy to have something to eat on Shabbat, here you're telling me that uh, if he did it intentionally with witnesses and a warning, uh, this guy's going to get stoned for giving charity and giving out food on the Shabbat. And that indeed precisely underlines the 
severity of the law of Shabbat. The Balabai, the owner of the house, should have invited the guy in to eat with him, not have him stand out in the street and hand the food out to him. Either he should have made sure the poor guy had what to eat before Shabbat, and if the guy knocks on his door after it's already Shabbat, he should invite him in, but not hand food out from inside the house to outside the poor guy in the street. So we've had now the first two cases from the point of view of the guy outside and the first two cases from the point of view of the guy inside. These are the Yetzir uh, Shabbos Shtayim Bifnim and Shtayim Bachutz, the carrying of Shabbos two from the point of view of the person inside if he will violate the Torah prohibition, and two, from the point of view of the person outside. And now we're going to have the secondary two acts where the whole labor is not carried out by either one of them, but it's joint labor. And let us at this point just pause to understand that the labor of Hotza'ah or Hachnasa on Shabbat consists of three stages. The first stage is called akira, where something is in one domain and somebody comes along and plucks it up from that domain and then they take it through the door or the window into the other domain. Only when they put it down in the other domain, that is called hanacha, the laying down. These are the three stages of the act. Akira, uprooting from domain at number one. The actual hachnasa or hotza'a, carrying it through, bringing it through the door, the window. And hanacha, the third stage, is putting it down in the other domain. So now in the last set of instances the Mishnah talks about, it says where the whole act was not performed by either one of the two. So we continue now. Poshat he'oni es yodo lifnim v'notal balabais metoicho if the poor man were to extend his hand from the outside, inside, through the window of the door, inside, with something in it, his basket, but here the house owner takes out the object from the hand of the poor man. So here the akira was performed by the poor man. When the poor man extended his hand in through the window or the door from the street, he has plucked up the object, rooted up the object from the public domain, the street, and he's passed it through the window, lefnim. but now when the balabayas, the householder, takes the basket, the balabayas has performed the hanacha, the laying down of the object inside the house. So that is not a complete performance of the malacha by either one of them. Each one has collaborated, and in such a case there is no liability, as we shall see. So that's the first of the rabbinical prohibitions where the person is exempt from the penalty. Second case, Oishen no san or if the balabayit, the householder, when the, the poor guy had extended his hand inside empty, and here, in the second case, the house owner puts an object into the hand of the poor guy, and the ha- poor guy puts the, uh, takes his hand out. So here again, they're both exempt, Shnehem Peturin, because in this case, it was the Balabait who performed the Akira, the uprooting of the object from inside the house. He put it into the poor guy's hand, and the poor man took his hand out, and now the poor man performed the Hanacha, the laying down. So neither has performed the complete action. In both cases, Shnehem Peturin. This was in the case where the poor man is the one putting his hand inside. In both cases, they are exempt because in both of those two cases, uh, the, uh, the act was not done by either one. 
The converse case now from the point of view of the guy inside the two secondary cases, which are forbidden mitrabonon, but uh, not chayov, no liability of the penalty. Poshat balabai says yoda lachutz, where it's the house owner that extends his hand outside. And the poor guy takes the loaf from the house owner. Or the poor man put the basket into the hand of the house owner and the house owner pulls it inside the house. They are both exempt. They are both exempt from the penalty of the violation of the Shabbat. The reason being because in each of these cases, uh, the act is performed as collaboration between the one that uh, performs the akira and the one that performs the hanacha, the one that uproots the object from where it was, the domain it was in, and uh, uh, the second one puts the object down in the other domain. Since this is not a complete malacha, a complete uh, violation, they are potu, they're exempt from the penalty. So with that, my dear friends, let us now conclude our studies for today. And uh, I hope that this uh, very uh, amazing and extraordinary Mishnah has begun to reveal its uh, mysteries to you. And we shall be continuing, God willing, in our next session, which will be on this coming uh, Wednesday. And with that, I would like to wish you from the holy city of Jerusalem, Shalom, Hemshech Yom Tov, a continuing good day, uh, Bracha and Hatzlacha, Shalom from Yerushalayim. Ich mag viel.